All right, let's go ahead and start the pipeline hazard practice problems. So we're gonna start off with a review. First, write down your answers, then discuss the answers with your group. So here are the two questions. Go ahead, pause the video, answer the questions first on your own, then discuss them with your partner. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. What are the three reasons we might have hazards in our data paths? Well, data hazards is one of them, control hazards is another, and structural hazards. Now, what are these coming from? So data hazards come when the data is not available where we need it. So for example, we saw an example where the data is later in the pipeline, but it hasn't been written back yet, so we can't read it out of the register file, or the data is not available when we need it. So we saw that example in the memory. So you have to wait for the memory to read, and the memory doesn't get you the data until the end of its cycle before you can use it. Control hazards are when we don't know what instruction is next. So we're going to go ahead and fetch, but we don't know whether we should take a branch or not. And structural hazards are when we can't do an instruction because we're using the hardware for something else. So for example, if we need to read and write to the register file at the same time, or if we need multiple ALUs, for example, an ALU for calculating if two things are equal and an ALU for adding on a branch address. So we created two ALUs in that case. Okay, so how do we address those issues? Well, for data hazards, we forward the data. So if the data is somewhere else, we can forward it from where it is to where we need it. Or if the data is not ready yet, we have to stall. So in the memory case, remember that if you need the data right after in the instruction right after a load, you can't do that because it takes an extra cycle to get it from the memory. It's not available in time, so we have to wait. For control hazards, we calculate the branch as early as possible. So we try to get it moved all the way back in the pipeline so we can do it as soon as we can. And we have to stall with the branch delay slot if we can't do it soon enough. And for structural hazards, we build more hardware. So that's what the double pump register file was or why we have multiple adders in our, in our pipeline. And what we're gonna see later on in the course is that we don't have to stall here for these control hazards if we could predict the future. We'll talk about that in the next few lectures. All right, so here's a question for you to do on your own. So pause the video, answer the question first on your own, then discuss with your partner. All right, so how many cycles do we need between dependent instructions in this pipeline with a double pump register file? So let's take a look. So will this pipeline work if the instructions are as far apart as possible? So we've got an instruction here, which is going to write back to the register file. And we've got an instruction over here, which is going to read it. So will this pipeline work? Well, can we send our data back like this and get it to the instruction? And then the to answer that question, we need to know, is the data going to be there on time? So the data is available at the beginning of the cycle here, and it gets around to this part, to the register file at the beginning of the cycle. Is that good enough? And the answer is yes. This is what this double pumped register file is. We're going to write it at the beginning of the cycle and read it at the end. So this instruction will read the value that came from this instruction. So this is fine. If we have two instructions between these, everything will work fine. So the answer is two instructions. So that's how close we can get. Anything closer to that and the data won't be there in time. All right, go ahead and find all the dependencies and instructions below. Pause the video, answer the question first on your own, then discuss with your partner. Okay, so here we have an instruction that's creating R2. It's writing a value into that. Here's an instruction that's using R2, instruction that's using R2, instruction that's using R2, and using R2 twice. So R2 is being used in all these instructions that's being created here. So these ones are clearly dependent, but is this one dependent down here? Is it dependent on the first instruction? Well, no, it isn't, because this subtraction is writing a new value into R2. So we're not using the same value up here, we're using this one. So these two here are actually dependent on this instruction instead. Then we can fill in what the other ones are. We've got a dependency there and a dependency there. Okay. Let's go ahead. Now we're going to do two forwarding examples. So we have two sets of instructions here, and we want you to add the necessary forwarding paths for these instructions to this pipeline here. So you're going to take your instructions, put them in the pipeline, and figure out where you need to forward from and to for each one of these. So you can go ahead and solve number one first, then we'll walk through it, and then we can pause again before we get to number two. So pause the video, answer the question together with your partner. And when you're ready, we can go ahead and we'll do number one first. So if you don't get number two, we can start number one first. All right, so let's look at the first one here. So the first one has a data dependency between this add, which generates a value in R3, which is then used in this subtract. So they're back-to-back -back instructions. So here's our add, it has R3. So that means that R3 is in the pipeline register here, which is generating this instruction. So the instruction and R3 are in this pipeline. So add has created them in the last stage. 
And then we have an instruction right after it, subtract. The subtract needs R3. So we have to figure out how to get our R3 value, which is in this pipeline stage, back around for this instruction as an input. So to do that, we need to forward from mem back around into execute. So if we do that, R3 is available here at the beginning of our pipeline stage, the beginning, beginning of the cycle. We can forward it around, and so the ALU can then use it at the beginning of its instruction and compute the next value. So we need to forward from instructions one cycle before it for this one here. All right, so you can go ahead and pause, and you can do the second one now if you didn't get that one before. So let's take a look at the second one here. So the second one, we have an add, which is generating or writing into R3, and then an add, which is using it, and now it's separated by an instruction in the middle. So we need a different forwarding path for this. So we can put this in here. Here's our first add, which has R3, and the instruction we're forwarding it to is two cycles before that. So here's the R3 that we need it from. So we need to forward from over here to here. So R3 is gonna be in this pipeline stage because this is our first add, which has, has R3 in its pipeline. We need to forward it around so that it arrives here in time for the ALU to use it in that stage. So this is the forwarding we need from this one. So if you take a look at it for these two different setups here, we need two different forwarding paths. For the one that's one cycle behind, we need to forward from memory to execute. And for one that's two cycles behind, we need to forward from right back into execute. And if we do that, we can handle all the cases where we have instructions that are one cycle behind or two cycles behind. All right, here's another peer instruction question. So go ahead, pause the video, answer first on your own, then discuss it with your partner. Actually, I should try to clarify this a little bit. So the question here is why don't we forward into the ID stage? So why don't we have any paths that go and forward into this part of the instruction stage itself? Sorry, the instruction decode over here, not the fetch stage. So why aren't we forwarding into this part of the pipeline? Okay, so let's take a look at these. So why aren't we forwarding into this stage here? So we can read directly from the register files. Is that why we don't forward? Well, that actually doesn't have anything to do with forwarding because forwarding is about data that's not in the register file yet. So the fact we can read from the register file here doesn't make a difference because if we need to forward, it means the data is not where we want it. We don't need the data at the start of the cycle. Well, if we did need the data in this cycle, we would need it at the start of the cycle because remember the double pumped register file writes early in the cycle. So if we did need to forward to here, we'd still need it early at the start of the cycle. The real answer is we don't use data in this stage. So instruction decode, we just put data into the pipeline register. We don't actually use it. So it doesn't matter if we put the wrong thing into the pipeline here, because then if we need to forward later, we'll replace it. And instead of using the data we put in there, we'll use it later. So even if we instruction decode put the wrong value into the register file, when we go here to use it, if we need to forward it, we'll forward it and not use that data, instead use data from somewhere else as appropriate. So the reason we don't forward into this stage here is we're not using the data in this stage, so we don't have to make sure we forward it to there to be correct. We can forward it later. All right, here's another peer instruction question. So go ahead, pause the video, answer the question on your own first, then discuss it with your partner. All right. So which stages might we need to forward to in this pipeline? So let's take a look. So in instruction fetch, we don't have an instruction. So if we don't have an instruction yet, we clearly can't need register values here. So we don't need to forward into here. In instruction decode, well, we just discussed that. We don't need it here because we don't use it. We're not actually computing on the value. So we don't need it there. How about in execute? Do we need to forward there? Well, yeah, the ALU needs the data to start the computation. So we need to get the data here early in the cycle so that the ALU can do the work. So that's what we need to forward it to because the ALU is actually gonna compute. So we definitely need it there. How about in memory? Well, in memory, we also need the data. So we need the address and we need the write data. And we need those so that we can start putting them into the memory at the beginning of the cycle. So just like the execute stage, which works with the data using the ALU, the memory stage works with the data by using it to feed into the memory. So we do need to forward there too. And how about write back? Well, there's nothing to forward from and write back. There are no earlier instructions, everything else is done, so we don't need to forward into write back. All right, now we're gonna practice dealing with load to use delays. So go ahead and start off on the first part of this, identify your dependencies. So go ahead, pause the video and answer the question together with your partner. Okay, so what are the dependencies we have here? Well, we're loading R15 and then we're gonna use R15, we're adding it. And we're loading R16 and we're gonna use it. 
So we have from this instruction to these two and this instruction to those two. Okay, the next step is to go ahead and insert no ops. So this won't work in a regular pipeline with double pop register file and regular forwarding. So you need to figure out what are the no ops that you need in this. And to help you out, here's a picture of the pipeline. So go ahead, pause the video and answer the question together with your partner. Where do you need to insert no ops? Okay, to answer this question, let's take a look at what happens in the pipeline. So where does the add need R15? So here's our add. So the add needs R15 when it's right here, it's in the ALU. So at this point here, we need R15 because we're doing the ALU, but load word, which has R15 is over here. So the question is, can we just forward it from here? Well, we have it one cycle before and we saw we could forward it. Can we forward the data from here to add? And when you see this, you should be thinking, okay, there's something a little strange about load word. What is that? And the tricky part here is we can't do this because this is only available at the end of the cycle. So there wouldn't be time for the ALU to do it. Remember before we could forward because it was in a pipeline register, which was available at the beginning of the cycle. So there was enough time to forward it. But load word has to go through the whole data memory before it has the value to forward. So this is too late. So what if we moved it one cycle? So if we move load word one cycle here, that's fine because now the value we want has been read out of the memory in the previous cycle and put in the pipeline register. Because it's in the pipeline register, we can now forward it around and get it there in time. So yes, we can do that if we put it one later. So that means we need to have a no-op between load word and add, and then we can use forwarding to solve it. So we need one no-op in there. All right, and it's the same thing for the next one. We need one no-op between that load word and this add. So if you look at what happens, we have these ones work here, the load word forwards to the add, then on the next cycle, everything moves over. We have our add going through the pipeline. Our load word is calculating its address. Then here we are, our load word goes into the memory stage. It's gonna load the value. And the next cycle, it's gonna be sitting here in the pipeline register. Now load word is in write back and we can go ahead and forward it to the add in the execute stage and everything works great. We had to add two no ops here. Okay. So we went and inserted our no ops. And so this is the code that we now have. And you notice this code is a lot longer. So it's gonna be a lot lower performance. Next part of this is go ahead and reorder the code so you can get better performance. So go ahead and pause the video and answer the question together with your partner. All right, so let's take a look at what we have here. Here's our load word. And now we're gonna get the value back from the data after we go through the data memory in the memory stage. We need to deliver that to add. So we can forwards like this with one cycle in between them. And here add can get forwarded to the ALU but we need to put something in here. So before we put in a no op, and then we did the same thing here, we put in another no op. So the question is, can we do a better job of this? So we're gonna reorder it. So the reordering is exactly what we can do. We can say, let's do these two loads together. So instead of this no op place here, let's put something useful in it. Let's take this load word and put it up in place of this. So this load word doesn't depend on that load word. So we can go ahead and have it earlier. Then we can have our ads. And what you notice here is we've still got one instruction between the load and the ad, one instruction between the load and the ad. Now they're just useful instructions instead of being no ops. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Here's our first load, which is gonna have its data available here. Here's our second load, which is gonna have its data available here. And then here's our first ad, which uses the results from that. And our second ad, which uses the result from that. And by doing that, we can still just take four cycles, but we take event, we do it correctly. We don't have back-to-back -back use of the memory here. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Here we've got all of our parts in here. And so we take the value, we forward it from this load word to that add, then we move on one. Now we forward it from that load word to that add. Okay, here's another peer instruction question. So go ahead, pause the video, answer the question first on your own, then discuss it with your partner. Okay, so let's break down what this means. So we've got a lot of words in here. What does otherwise ideal mean? Well, it means the pipeline is always full and there are no other delays. So this means everything's working perfect. So each instruction takes one cycle, except for these ones we're dealing with. What's a one cycle load to use delay? Well, it means we can't forward from our memory to our execute stage. This is exactly what we've been seeing. We need one cycle between loads and executes in order to do things. So we need an extra cycle in there. Now it says for half of them, we can't do this here. So what does that mean? Well, we compiler can only find independent instructions for half of them. Well, for half of them means that of our 20% loads, 10% of them require a no-op. So this means 10% of the time we're gonna have to insert a no-op because we have this load to use delay. All the rest of the time, things are gonna give us one instruction every cycle. Now we can start computing this. 
So let's take a look at what would happen if we didn't have to put any no ops. So this is the perfect case where we don't have a load to use delay. Well, if we had 100 instructions, 20 of them would be loads. In the perfect case, none of them would need no ops. So then we get 100 useful instructions plus zero useless no ops is 100 instructions. Each one finishes in one cycle. So 100 cycles for 100 instructions is one cycle per instruction. That's the ideal performance. But this processor doesn't work that well. So in 100 instructions, 20 of them are loads. And 10 of those, or half of them, need an extra no op. So now we have 100 useful instructions plus 10 useless no ops. So we have 110 instructions total. Each one finishes in one cycle. So in 110 cycles, we get 100 useful instructions done. Remember, we've got these other 10 useless instructions we had to do because we couldn't fill them in. So that means it's now 1.1 cycles per instruction. So we're 10% slower. OK. So here's another practice problem. So we've got a program here. So how long will this code take on a five-stage MIPS pipeline with forwarding and appropriate no ops inserted? So go ahead, pause the video, and answer the question together with your partner. OK, so let's take a look at how we fill this in. So here's our first instruction. It's going to go ahead and generate results. And this R5 that we're going to need, we're going to have to use somewhere else. Actually, we don't use it in the program. So then we're going to do our load. Our load is going to generate R6. But we need that R6 next in this subtraction instruction. So we can't get it directly. So we're going to have to forward it here and put in something in the middle, some sort of no op that doesn't do anything. So this is our instruction or program. We're going to have to have one extra no op in the middle here. All right, so here's the question. Since we're talking about both no ops and bubbles, what's the difference between a pipeline bubble and a no op? So go ahead, pause the video, answer the question first on your own, then discuss it with your partner. OK, so let's take a look at this here. Here we've got an example problem where we had a no-op in here, and it allowed us to forward things one cycle later. And then we have another example with a bubble. Here's our load word, and we had to stop it here because their ad came in, and it needed this. So there was a dependency that was here. We converted this to a no-op, so we stopped this instruction, and then we tried it again. And so if you look at what happens here, it looks exactly the same. We ended up with this one cycle later. We ended up with a no-op in the middle. The difference here is that in the bubble, the hardware detects and converts it to a no-op. And an actual no-op, the software is stuck in there. So the compiler has to add it. So the only difference here is how they're inserted. They do the same things in the pipelines. OK, let's go ahead and practice memory to memory stalls. So first, fill in the pipeline for the following code with no forwarding. So you need to add bubbles from stalls. And then fill in the pipeline, assuming that you have forwarding. And here are the instructions that we have. All right, pause the video, answer the questions together with your partner. OK, so now we're going to do this without forwarding. So we've got an add in here, and the add's going to generate a result. And so without forwarding, we then need the result in this load word instruction. So we need it at the register file. So we're going to have to forward it here so it's ready in time for the ALU to load it. So we've got two pipeline bubbles in here. And this is what we saw at the beginning of the lecture. If you don't have any forwarding, you need to have two delays between each instruction. And then we'll have the same thing for store word. We'll have to have two of them in there so that it can get its results. OK, now what if we do have forwarding? So go ahead, pause the video, and answer the question together with your partner with forwarding. Well, in forwarding, we can fix the add one here. So we can get the add directly to the load word for the next cycle by forwarding it from where it's available here in the, the next cycle, so in the memory stage, back to the execute stage like this. So that's great. But we still have this problem with the memory here. So the memory is going to load a value, and then we want to store the value. And that's available at the end, so we have to forward it. We have to delay it. Now, there's a question here. Can we forward from memory to memory? So this is available at the end of memory, and we need it in the next memory. So can we put in another forwarding path? So go ahead and see if you can figure out if there's another forwarding path we could put in that would solve this, solve this problem. OK, so the answer is yes, we can. We can do the regular forwarding we had here, from forwarding from the memory stage back to the execute stage. And then we can do another thing where we can actually forward from the memory stage, sorry, at the end of the memory stage here, back to the memory stage. So this forwarding path looks like this. We've got a value here. We're going to forward it right into the memory stage. So that's an interesting forward. It takes results right into the memory stage. So that's only going to be useful for memory values that need memory values, sorry, for memory instructions that need memory values that came from other memory instructions. And when would that ever happen? This happens for copying. So look what we did here. We loaded a word, and then we stored that same word. 
So we're making a copy of a memory address here. And so this forwarding path is actually really helpful for copying. It makes each copy take one cycle less, but because it's coming from the data memory and to the data memory, you can see it taking the value you have in the previous data memory cycle and forwarding it. It's only useful for load word to store word instructions. All right, so now it's time for the reflection questions. So go ahead, pause the video, answer the question on your own. And now for the second part, go ahead, swap your answers and help out your partner. And when you're done with that, you're all set. Thanks.